So, uh, Edmund, how is it? Uh, because it was not recorded. Now only starting recording. Okay. You want, to, you want to just continue from here or? I think we better continue. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Proceed. Uh -huh. Start the recording. Uh. Okay. Okay. So why we are so why we are using this kind of the very fundamental, very basic uh, application available in the world currently because of, of the flexibility of the application that we, we have here, such as the WeChat, such as the WhatsApp, such as the in, in, uh, Telegram, because of the flexibility to send and to share files. Next one to send and to share files like such as an image, images, document, video, songs, and voice and etc. here. So not only that, this kind of the apps also allowing us to utilize a video chat as well and also sending the messages around to the student there. So as well as also this application also allow us to create the globe. Why I mentioned here that the flexibility for using this kind of the SMS, WeChat, WhatsApp, very basic common SMS because of the flexibility that we can send any information to any student in a group or any student individually to them, to remind them, to do them, to share with them, to, to, to do all kinds of the discussion, either individually or either in the group. That would be the very convenient for us to do any time. No need to have a so-called uh, a fixed meeting uh, time for them to, to to have the meeting here. Next one. So from here that from here you can see that we have the tips for creating the effective online lesson. Firstly, you can see from here that we we what we need to do is we just of the WeChat of a WhatsApp or Telegram here. So from the from the after we created the group, you can see that we need to tell the so-called the group what are the so-called established uh, the rules that we have to be in the uh, WeChat group later on. As well as we need to tell the student what are the things that the lessons that or Q and A that we are going to discuss in the group for WeChat. So we also need to prepare our session our lesson or even our discussion into a different kind of mode, very fundamental whereby we can send images, we can send audio messages, even we can send video to the student individually or in the group here as well. So you can see also that all those things, we can convert all our information into the so-called PDF file, then share it throughout the so-called throughout the group in the WeChat or in the WhatsApp. So not only that, besides that, we also can create a short video clip or a short voice messages to tell or to teach the student through the WeChat application here. So you can see is how flexible it is to use this kind of application online. So because of some of the countries like China or like the Kenya, they could not access the so-called the Google Meet at all and also to, to use the any that related to Microsoft sometimes. So we have to break it out. We have to break through their, their firewall. So in order to use it properly, so you can see how, how crucial it is. We have to back to the very basic component to use it to get in touch with the student around the world, especially in China and other countries. All right, you can see that from here, we need to get the student engaged in the activity. So thereby, so we have to create our own very short video or short voice video, uh, voice messages to send it over to the group or send it individually, or even the student who would like to ask any question anytime, they can pop in their, their message messages to me individually or even to the group as well. So from here, we can share and discuss with the student personally as well. So, so not only that, the video size is very small, so easily for us to handle. Even, even we can record our video anywhere we want. For example, we can we can record our video in the room, in the kitchen, in the whatever, to tell, to explain things that the student wants to know. 
So what are the are the, the theories? What are the, the, the practical things that the programming languages that they want to know? We can explain through the video or maybe the voice app, uh, voicemail messages that to send off to the WeChat. So from here, you can see not only that from that particular video, we can turn it into the assessment. We can turn it into the activities that let them assess what we discuss throughout the, the session in the WeChat later on. So from here, and then another thing, the last one is the tips itself is we can have the assign an additional reading using the PDF file, then send it off to the student. So you can see how flexible it is whenever you are using this kind of the WeChat or WhatsApp. Even though we can, even though we know that uh, like the Microsoft team and Google and uh, Skype or Zoom, all kinds of the application available in the the world, they do have a very powerful features available in their system. But unfortunately, the more powerful feature that available sometimes cause the problem to the student to access, to use it, or even to break through this, the network from their country to our Malaysia here. So we have to be, we have to think of such a, a problem that available around the world later on. So next one will be how we, if, if we are if we are using this type of the application, very basic application, we need to think of our cost plan. We need to design a proper and suitable cost plan to suit their needs and to suit the discussion and to suit our the session of the thing here. Firstly, we need to think of our learning objective. Whether each session that we are discussing, is it achieve the first learning objective or second learning objective. We cannot do all those things in one shot because WhatsApp and WeChat or any basic SMS component, we cannot have very big objective to achieve. So we need to narrow down then slowly one by one to achieve it. So secondly, we have to review our activities here. So whatever activities that we prepare, we need to send it to the student either through the WeChat, either through the WhatsApp, even we can send it through another website that we created, then send the URL, then let them access the URL, then let them engage into the activities that we created outside from the, 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 the WeChat here, all right? So from assessment point of view, that we have to think of the so-called how to create the quiz, all the quizzes or any kinds of assessment that that we need to grade them. So from here, we have to get the feedback from the student, how we assess them. We can have the other method to be online that ask them to fill in. Another way around, we send the questions to the student or we send anything to the student through WhatsApp or to WeChat that ask them immediately to respond to our question personally, individually. So that would be the other way to assess them. So another thing is the lecture. The lecture slide that we are prepared to the student must be simple yet clear. Then so that we what we, we need to do is we need to create a video chat for them to have a look at it, how we are going to present to them, how are, how are we going to plan for the lecture for them. So all those things very, very simple, short and precise for, for the video clip that we are created here. So not only that we have to know, the next one will be check our knowledge and what we think, what, what do we think here. So it means that we have to, uh, to let the student know what are the answers, what are the answers that they want to know, what are the questions that they want to ask, all those things, send their so-called response through the text message either individually or in the group. Sometimes students they are they, they, they are feel they, they, they will they will feel shy to send in the group, so they can send into the the individual chat room for, for, for me to, to comment, to give comment, to give suggestion. To their in, uh, for, for their assignment personally and also make the topic lecture engaging. Why I say so? Because when we discuss our lecture through the WeChat video call here, so we present directly using the video call. But when do when we have the questions from the student, they will ask you through the chat, uh, WhatsApp, all those things through personal WhatsApp to us so that from here we can respond them one by one. And even whatever WhatsApp or WeChat, supposedly, and not only that, we also can record the video section using another software to record our screen mode here. 
so that we can keep a record, then send it, then send it, send it out to them using the YouTube or using other method to let them refer back to the video that what we have been discussed in the class here. So with the written assessment, you can see from here we have two components there. First is a student procedure. So what the student need to do? So they need to write the answer either in a piece of paper, then send it back to us or email us or send it back to the, the WeChat room that, that they have here, then capture the image, then file it properly in the PDF, then we can keep the record one by one as well. So not only that, they can have the so-called, we can have the record of the message WeChat properly one by one as well. So as a proof that they have been active, they have been engaged uh, in the activities that we, we, we've we been discussed throughout the whole session of our lecture. Next. So you can, from the, from the last few years, that from my observation itself, we can see from here that students are more connected and also telling about each other progress because we are asking about the so-called the next slide please we are asking the so-called the uh, student the student can ask more questions and also how they can request certain things individually from us here not in the globe so not only that from the using this kind of the uh, application we can keep on reminding them keep on reminding them from time to time next week is a submission of the lab so next week is a uh, is a quiz that we are going to take from day to day we can send just one one message text to them to remind them so that the student more engaged they they, they feel that they feel that they are into the section more than they they, they they also appreciate the effort that we put it in to the class that we, we are we are conducting for them. Also, the student also feels satisfied because we are in the group. Then also we always respond to the group chat with them. Any question that they want to ask, we can immediately answer the question through the group or even the individual session as well. And also the student can improve from the knowledge because whatever that we share, not only share in the group, but we also sharing all those things into the so-called the personal knowledge itself. Uh, next, 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 next. So you can see from here, from my own observation for the last few years, and even for the for last few semester as well, you can see that the connection with the student, the question that they ask, then reminder, reminder them, let them remember what are the activities, what are the exams that they need to take. They feel appreciate with uh, what we have done to them. So they also satisfied with the involvement of lecturer in the group here, as well as they can improve their skill, improve their knowledge throughout the, the whole session of the lecture individually means that it's a personal one-to-one -one session that we can coach them directly. Next one. So from the, not only from my observation itself, so during normally at the end of my lecture every semester, I will ask, I will ask the student, next one, what do you think? How do you think? How do you feel? All those things, uh, these are the sum uh, testimonials from the student when they are using so-called, when they are using the WeChat, WhatsApp, or any kind of the very basic SMS. So you can see from here, they said, they, they mentioned that I talked to the new friend, why? Because if the class is so big, if the class is so big, in the WeChat room or in the WhatsApp room, they can individually talk to the student that they want, individually, or even they can talk in the group discussion as well. And even they can create their own group discussion outside from the class as well. Why they say that the technology is fun? Because they can share. They can share any knowledge or any information throughout the, the outside from the topic as well. For example, myself also sometimes I share the information related to the life. Sometimes I share information related to something else to, to let them think twice or let them think what are the things that they have to think of here. So some of the students also think that the task is easier because they can ask us anytime. Even sometimes students ask me, 
uh, in the middle of the night here, sometimes one o'clock in the morning. So I still respond them in the morning as well. It's depending on the what kind of question that they are trying to ask us here. All right. So not only that, they, they think that from the way that in the using the WeChat or WhatsApp or Telegram, they, are, they, they can learn language more faster as well. Even not only the, 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 the knowledge, like for example, I'm teaching programming language. They are also learning the so-called vocabulary of the English language as well, because whatever that we type to them, we are using a proper language to, to, to tell them. Even sometimes we are typing in the English, sometimes we are typing in the Malay as well. But some of the students, if and only especially the China student, they cannot understand in English, I still can type it in the Mandarin for them. Then with the Mandarin language on the top, English language on the bottom, normally I will do two lines for them so that not only they, they, they can read in Mandarin, they also learn from the Mandarin to the English as well. So that's why from few that uh, really appreciate what we have done and what we have contributed to, to throughout the whole, whole session of the lecture. OK, I think that's all from me. If you do have any questions, so you, you, you may ask me. Thank you. Next one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edmund, for yeah, such a very detailed and uh, comprehensive uh, experience that you have in sharing these experiences to us. Uh, Sami, is there any particular question you want to raise? Otherwise, you can also uh, raise your hand and put on your mic. Sami? Um, there is no question in the meeting chat. Maybe the participant can ask directly to, uh, to Dr. Edmund. Yes, we are open. Whoever, feel free to just unmute and just ask. Ah, no question. Huh? OK. <laughs> So I think no everyone very, I think everyone very familiar with the WeChat, WhatsApp, all those things. Yeah? But the the power, I think I need to to, to give one one uh, my my personal opinion. The power of the WeChat and WhatsApp and uh, Telegram, all those things, more than what we, we we expected here. So it is very useful and it is very convenient for us to to assess, uh, to, to get in touch with our students around the world here. All right. Yeah. Uh, to, to me personally, I feel that uh, the tools, there are many, many tools, but more important than the tools is actually the way that uh, Edmund created his uh, online lesson to make it appropriate so that uh, there can also be the engagement, there can also be the higher order thinking uh, going on. Okay. Yeah, the instructional design of the, the instructional content. Design. Yeah, That's right. The instructional design of the content must be properly engage the student into our our class here using a very basic like the WeChat here. So that would be the, the 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 beauty of it. Even though people might think that why we should use WhatsApp, why we should use WeChat, because some of the student cannot be assessed using Google Google Meet. Some of the assess cannot be assessed using the Zoom and Skype P and whatever. So we have to go back to the very conventional way. We have to go back to the very fundamental way to, to, to assess them. Okay, got one people raise help the hand T T. Okay. Hello, Dr. Edmund. Hi. Hi, my name is Trixie. I am a lecturer at the uh, Faculty of Social Science and uh, Humanities. Yes, yes, yes. So we have large classes, uh, co faculty courses, more mm -hmm. than, than 300 students at a time. 98% mm -hmm. uh, may be domestic students. We have a few from uh, Japan, China, Philippines, like that. Um, mm -hmm. My question is uh, we are already. I, my, I myself personally very invested in uh, WhatsApp um, and I, I don't want to miss out the few international students in the crowd and of course if, you know, I double up and uh, write them emails and so on which they can receive um, 
however, it's not as directly engaging nor satisfying in that sense for them or myself. Uh, my question is, how do I incorporate WeChat and Telegram if I'm already using uh, WhatsApp extensively? How do I uh, do I drop? I mean, do I convert to one or the other? Or how, what is your opinion on that? Yeah. Normally, like for example, I will you I will ask the student to register both or three three apps here. Okay. So, for example, when I want to. If in my class, for example, I got to have an experience, my class to have a China student, my class to have an Indonesian student, my class also to have the so-called uh, Indian student or Pakistan as well as Bangladeshi. Okay, they different different types of the student uh, from a different country here. So in my class, normally first thing first, when you want to get into my class, you have to register two apps. One is WeChat, one is WhatsApp. All right, so both of them, they have to, they need to register it. So from here, I can rush all the information to both of the information easily. Okay, so if one of the student cannot access, for example, the China student cannot access using WhatsApp, for example, because WhatsApp in China, they need to use a VPN. Every time they want to use WhatsApp, they need to use, they need to open out the VPN only allowed to use a network then only can access a whatsapp but unfortunately the whatsapp that in china that even though they can use sometimes they cannot access the video through whatsapp cannot access the image even they cannot access the voice messages as well so that that would be the one limitation in china that if they are using whatsapp so that's why china is fully use of the wechat so that's why Normally in the class, I will ask them to do both or three things here. OK, so from here we will if if we need to know the class itself, is it got China student or whatever student? If they if they got a the student, then we have to move all our class into the WeChat already. All right. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. If anyone more put up the hand. OK, I think uh, Dr. Edmund, thank you so much for your uh, thank you, valuable Prof. sharing. It, I believe yeah. it will be very beneficial to each and every one of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Prof. Yes. We shall now call upon the second speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Kenneth. OK, and uh, Dr. Kenneth will share on the topic called development of MOOC uh, insights and challenges. Now, the ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, dear colleagues, uh, has really increased a lot of interest and enrollment in online education through MOOC. So uh, I was just checking uh, this morning uh, on the report uh, given by uh, Coursera, and it says that during uh, April until now, they have a 12 million increase uh, of uh, enrollment. Normally it's only 8 million, but now they got 20 million. Uh, edX, normally 5 million for 2019, but this few months you know, alone is 8 million. And so is future learn and so on. So uh, there's something about MOOC. So what is MOOC? Why MOOC is so important? How to develop you know, international quality MOOC? We have the right person here this afternoon with us, Dr. Kenneth. Now, Dr. Kenneth uh, has just recently uh, completed designing, developing, and even conducting and implementing an international MOOC. He was invited actually by Commonwealth of Learning uh, because of his uh, expertise in bio risk uh, management. So, this course uh, attracted more than 1,200 students from all over the world. And there were more than 30 countries uh, that was involved. So we are so proud, you know, that uh, that the Kenneth had been the first Malaysian to be organized by this international agency to conduct this course. His experience is valuable for us in UMS. Dr. Kenneth, we look forward to your sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Hong. Can you hear me? And is the screen visible? We hear you loud and clear, and we see your screen. Okay, but I'll can commence. you put it to slide yeah. share? Yeah, I will just commence. I will transition to slide share. So, is the recording on, Nora? Yeah, is it okay, Prof? Now? Yes, still recording. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, Prof. Okay. Very clear. Good. Thank you very much, Prof. Fong, and a very good afternoon. Salam, salam, uh, salam, sajatra to all our viewers. Thank you very much. And I'm going to present to you about the challenges we faced during the development of our MOC. So basically what we did is during the over the course of the last year, I designed and developed an MOC. And the purpose of the design and development was not for my benefits. It's basically to understand how the system works and to look at it and observe it. So what I did is I developed a MOC based on a topic of interest, which is bio-risk management. And then let's delve into what we experienced during the course of its development. OK, now this is one of the uh, MOC platforms, which is almost very well known. It's called Masterclass. And the reason why I have highlighted this platform or why I'm bringing it up is because it highlights expertise. Now, if you want to write a novel, a book, you can actually go to and learn from one of the top authors. If you want to become a chef, you can learn from another author. So what has happened in the world is a transitioning from a conventional educator, as in a lecturer, to all of these personalities who are educators. In fact, you can learn acting, you can learn uh, choreography, you can learn almost everything via masterclass. And the cost of the masterclass is basically only around 60 ringgit to 80 ringgit per month. And you can attend the entire series. So this is one of the developments which is currently uh, taking the world by storm in the pandemic time, as people cannot access these courses in face-to-face -face mode. Okay. In addition to this, we have our conventional MOOC platforms, which are the Coursera and the uh, EDX and other platforms which offer certificates from reputed institutions. Now, earlier when these MOOC platforms were developed, there was no interest from industry players because they, were, they viewed these MOCs as uh, lower than degrees. You see, and you must understand that these MOCs and these courses online have been developed for the US market. In the US market, there is actually a very high fees. It costs around 60,000 US dollars to complete a basic bachelor's degree. And so there has been a transitioning to MOCs. Okay, now these MOCs are basically courses which you take online, you get assessed online, and then you get certified if you complete the assessment. So that's basically what drives MOCs. So why have MOOCs become so popular? The first reason is modular education. So MOOCs are basically modular education. If you are familiar with the IKEA concept in which all the furniture is modularized and then you assemble it together, you can assemble MOOCs into a full-fledged degree program. Now, you may be aware that the Ministry of Education in Malaysia also is proposing the usage of uh, what are known as micro-credentials. So micro-credentials are a subset of an original course. To explain this briefly, uh, you have your conventional course. We have our courses over a period of 14 weeks. So micro-credential may cover only between four to six weeks, and that will be a small element of the original course. So that is a micro-credential. Now, there have been some universities which are promoting micro-credentials by basically offering uh, smaller courses in the form of MOCs, which are certified. The second aspect is the scalability. You can scale up your MOOC or down based on the audience. Its MOOCs are also very flexible because you can change the content as the MOOC progresses. And then they are recognized globally by certain corporations such as uh, Google and Microsoft. In fact, uh, in the Silicon Valley, if you read about the trends, increasing number of employers are recognizing micro-credentials and uh, MOOCs. So students have another avenue for basically improving their marketability. Okay, now why are we interested in MOOCs? Now, as a university in Sabah, we face multiple challenges. First of all is our location itself, and second is the connectivity. However, we have a large number of experts at UMS who can offer their expertise in terms of the subject matter. So we have to transition to MOCs as part of our strategy in line with the higher educational blueprint. So we have a Malaysian higher educational blueprint which focuses on transitioning to e-learning. And most of us during your career, if you're a young lecturer, 
you will try you will face this challenge in maybe five to ten years time in which case your MOOC or your course content will be translated into an online component and you'll have to deliver it online in fact this is essential for the survival of many educational institutions in the overseas for instance in the us which uh, gets a lot of uh, uh, fee in uh, fee income from the China and the Asian students, they are currently now facing a problem with the pandemic. So they have to basically transition to online. So there has been an explosion in the development of online technology in the US and in Europe as they struggle to survive. So basically we have a term which is known as Uberization of educa education. If you know that word Uber, it refers to the taxi and it's basically taken over by other players, but Uber was the first one which was established in the world, so we call it Uber. And what is Uberization of education is basically content which is uh, posted online in the form of MOC, and the content is basically driven by market demand. So in a Uberized course, such as the one offered on Masterclass or on the, on the uh, Coursera, there'll be a graded increment in the fees if the course is more viable in the market. So basically these are market driven courses. It also capitalizes on your experience in terms of your expertise. For instance, in Borneo, we have specialized uh, expertise in the area, in the fields of, for example, in the f f fields of native uh, culture. These can be converted into MOCs and they will have a high value globally. Okay, and then you also, when you are conducting MOC, you're con constantly required to improve the quality and this basically serves as a very strong initiative for or an impetus for personalized development. And you have the customer uh, demands which are evolving, automation and lifelong learning markets. Now, the evolving customer demand and automation are actually interconnected. As the world transitions into automation and the use of uh, mechanized factories, for example, mechanized production, mechanized agriculture, there will be a significant amount of job losses. And the students who are interested in these courses related to automation, for instance, uh, like automobile engineering, there may be a decline because there will be a transitioning to other career paths. And a student or an employee cannot attend a whole course or program at a university over a period of four years. So they have the option of MOOCs. And this is basically catering to customer demand. OK, so we follow the AD model. So those of you all who are from education field, and I have learned it from the educators as well. So we follow the NL, uh, ADD IE model when we design and develop MOOCs. So, okay, what's different in the case of MOCs as compared to traditional uh, educational models is that we look at the ecosystem, basically the market demand. So we have something known as analyze market demand. We design the course to cater to market demands develop innovative content, implement and resolve technical issues and evaluate and improve upon the content. So this is the workflow for MOOC design and development. So we begin with analysis of market demand. Now we analyze market de demand based on analytics. You can obtain data from Google Analytics and you can basically look at market demand for courses based on the market. This is what is being done by private universities. We designed the course so we design courses which uh, cater to market demand. Basically courses which do not cater to demand will become defunct or will no longer have takers. Then we have to develop innovative content. Now this is where content development is the arena where you as an expert have the requisite tools. So you know what content is required by your students and that's where your role comes into play. The next part is implementation. So this is basically something which we can we can manage at the Center for e-learning because this con, uh, concerns the technical issues such as delivery of content, the platforms, and the content development itself. And finally, we do the evaluation. So all of our MOOCs basically have a uh, analytical component. So the student uh, submits their forms, uh, response form, as well as the evaluation done by the system itself. Okay. So I'll move on to the next part is you yourself as a lecturer or an academician or a subject matter expert. So you have to begin by asking yourself these questions. This cannot be decided by someone else. It's something which is personal and is decided by you. So you have to decide what is your expertise? Is your expertise up to the mark in your field? And this is only known to you because you compare yourself with other courses and your peers and you know your level of expertise. You have to also look at the demand for your expertise. So is there a demand for that particular expertise? 
can you develop the content around your expertise and do you feel the need to constantly evolve now e learning has raised the benchmark for teaching and learning because now we are supposed to be or expected to be at the leading edge our customers are very demanding the student is your customer as well as your parent the parent of the student is the customer so they are demanding they will ask usually when you private universities when they have these road shows and the uh, the educational fairs the parents will always ask the question will uh, my son or daughter be able to obtain employment after investing 60000 to 100000 ringgit malaysia so that's what we need to cater to when we develop the moc okay so the mooc is basically designed around your expertise and in some cases you may have to tweak or adjust your expertise so as to cater to a specific market demand okay so we now move on to the assistance which will be provided by the center for e learning so we will assist you in developing the mooc so there are four basic stages which are content design content development content delivery and finally certification application so we have a content design uh, system so we can assist you in the development of content because we have a grant to assist you using animators and we have a uh, basically a facility to design content so we will assist you in content development but the actual content design which is the lectures has to be done by the subject matter expert the content delivery is done via our platform and finally the certification is something which we arrange via the center for e learning Okay, so this is my experience with MOCs. Okay, I will share this experience with you because I want you to be aware of the challenges which we face during MOC development. So, uh, Professor Fong has uh, currently a grant with the Commonwealth of Learning, which has been supporting us over the past three years, and we decided to experiment with regard to UMS ability to develop. MOCs now this was an experiment so i did it as an experimental basis to determine whether we have the capacity to develop MOCs and if i can do it everyone else can do it so that's basically what i, I tried to do so we have to meet the criteria for the MOC so commonwealth of learning has a consultant and there was dr sanjay mishra and he is very uh, particular about the content itself so we spent about one month developing the content because it went back and forth between me and him because he needed uh, the content to be basically at least 99% perfect for delivery okay so that's what is their standard so that's what we tried to attain okay so basically the course which we selected was bio risk management because it has a high demand due to the pandemic uh, we have a targeted audience post graduates and professionals we decided to distribute it globally and we decided to provide certificates so these are the four factors which you must look at into when developing your own moc now when we did this moc right we actually spent some money targeting users using youtube so i developed a very short advertisement on youtube which was about a minute long and i posted it online and i paid around 400 us dollars to do the marketing for this moc so that uh, youtube video could be analyzed for and targeted for specific audiences so i uh, targeted around 100000 users and i basically got uh, a hit from around 12000 youtube users so that's the way we use the targeted marketing for the moc now suppose we develop a ums moc we will be using uh, some kind of marketing platform to ensure that your course is basically uh, distributed or the students across the world are aware of your moc so we have that uh, experience with marketing that moc via youtube okay so what is the content of uh, moc so this is the standard content which i developed in accordance with the guidelines from the uh, commonwealth of learning we had the course synopsis which is similar to your table 4 and it is more detailed uh, dr edmund has developed a, a platform for you or basically a template for you for the course synopsis i had 15 lecture modules distributed over a period of 4 weeks however you can have fewer modules i had four quizzes and one assignment okay so that's the uh, basic content of moc so this is our course content so in our course content we basically have uh, four weeks of instruction and the fifth week is assessment now the mooc 
which I basically uh, implemented is a MOOC which is driven by the uh, instructor. So there are two types of MOOCs. One is the instructor driven and one is the student driven or the user driven. Now in the instructor driven MOOC, I decide when I post the content and this kind of MOOCs have an advantage because most of the students will complete the MOOC unlike the other MOOCs in which case the students will not complete it or leave it halfway. OK, so this is our uh, dashboard. So UMS is currently installing a similar platform. It's based on MOOCit. So when you, you see your dashboard, you can see at any given time the activity in that course. So I have around 1059 registered students and 624 active students. OK, and then I can see the posts and this dashboard is like a automobile. Uh, what do you call dashboard? It can be viewed at any given time and you can analyze the course content at any given time. So this is one of the analytics which must be done when you conduct a globalized MOC. So we had around students from around 33 countries and I was surprised that we even had a student from Peru from South America who still keeps in touch with me on email. He is a bio risk manager in Peru, so he benefited from this MOC. OK, so this is student interaction. Now this is actually a map of interaction. So every time you have a chat, it shows up on the analytics platform in the MOOC system and you can see I'm in the center because I have been uh, basically communicating with almost everyone in forums or in chats. So we had around 3000 uh, messages shared during the five week or six week MOOC because even after the MOOC was completed, there are still people uh, making queries regarding certificates and content. So this is showing you the level of interaction which we require and participating in the MOOC for the six weeks or five weeks is a full time exercise because you need to be engaged with the students. They are a global audience and they will be from different countries in the world in different time zones. So that's the challenge of the MOC. OK, so upon completion of the MOOC, each of the participants was issued a certificate and we have a completion certificate as well as attendance certificate. So they only uh, issued the completion certificate if they meet the criteria of the MOOC and as I have basically blanked out all the signatures for because I don't want it to be shared but basically it's signed off by the vice chancellor by myself and the collaborator which is the president of the Commonwealth of Learning. So because we are basically using their signature we as lecturers have to be very short to maintain the standard. I cannot compromise on the standard of the MOC during that course, because if there is a complaint or if there is some issue, it will look very bad on UMS. So we have to comply with the stringent criteria for quality, quality of the content, as well as the quality of assessment during MOC. So that basically helps us a lot because as lecturers, it raises the bar and we ex exceed basically the requirements of the MQA and the certification agencies because we are actually moving on to the globalized platforms. OK. So this is a time. So when I did the MOC, I actually did a time course analysis. I analyzed my behavior and the time I spent developing the MOC. And this is the rough um, estimation. So I've done a precise estimation on Google Calendar. So the content design with in, in collaboration with the uh, course, uh, basically the consultant took around 60 hours, man hours. The content development, which is the slides and the production of the slides took around 200 hours because I have to develop all the content by myself. The videos and editing was done with a research assistant, so it took around 60 hours. The delivery itself over the five weeks was around 120 hours, and the assessment of around 300 assignments took around 150 hours. So this is the amount of time which is actually spent. So in total, around 590 man hours spent on the MOC itself. OK, now I've spoken about myself and my experiences. We now move on to what you as a lecturer can do and what we will assist you in doing. So the first step is basically having your course topic ready. After you do the course topic, Dr. Edmund will then uh, give you a template. So that's the course documentation. This template is required in order to maintain the quality standards of that MOC. So when you develop content, it will be sent to a reviewer in order to comply to the standards of the MOC. OK, the next uh, part will be training sessions conducted by our Center for e-learning. Earlier, we used to do the sessions on in face to face with selected lecturers, but now we will do it online. We then move into the design and development of the content. 
So this has to be done by yourself with your lecture notes, and we will assist you in video filming uh, as the content development progresses. We will then deliver it on the UMS MOOC platform, and it then comes back to you, assess the student's performance, and then we do a basic delivery of the course and improvement of the course. So that's basically the steps which you need to follow. Okay, so for more information, you are please feel free to contact me. So some of oh, you can also contact Dr. Ang Yap Wang, who is uh, we call Edmund, who is the coordinator for the MOC and OER. Okay, so that's the basic experience which I had with the development of MOCs. It was very challenging and it took up a lot of energy, but at the end of the day, it's worth it because the experience which we gain can be shared with you. Okay, with that, I would like to end my presentation and take in questions. So thank you very much and stay safe. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Fong. You can, uh, we can open up for Q&A now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth, for the wonderful sharing. Sami, could you uh, highlight any question? Um, at the moment, there's no question yet. But I uh, I saw that Prof. Uh, Vincent have shared the uh, MQA Garis Panduan for micro credential. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Vincent. Yeah. We will refer to that. Yes, thank you, Prof. Vincent. That is very useful and important. Yes. Has someone raised their hand? If you have raised your hand, you can open. You can basically open up the mic and speak. If you have raised your hand. Hi, Dr. Trixie. Hello, Dr. Trixie. Yes, hello. So nice to hear your experience finally. We've been waiting for this uh, sharing from you. I have a question. Yeah, I, I just wondered with so much time that you spent, uh, I know it was experimental in a way what you did with the MOOC, but did you not have an assistant at all? Okay, so basically, Dr. Trixie, to answer your question, thank you very much. So the first thing was the content development was done entirely by me. So I have to develop my PowerPoint slide because we have a research assistant, but she is not an expert in the subject. So what I did, I developed the content myself and then uh, she did the video recording, editing and the uh, basically all the parts which are related to upload of that content onto the onto the website, the MOOC website. But what has to be taken into account is that you have a lot of help. For instance, if you see my slides, I have prepared a presentation for you on this particular platform. OK, you know uh, which software I have used for that. I have used the Microsoft Office uh, PowerPoint online. So I use online tools. So that one has an artificial intelligence system which will enable you to design the slide based on your need. You just, it's just one click. So you basically introduce your content into a blank PowerPoint. You introduce your images, which are copyright free, and you assign the task of designing the slide to the artificial intelligence. If you have noticed during my presentation, right, it was moving the slides for me automatically, which I didn't want it to do. So basically what it's doing is that it's looking at the text in the slide and it's reading the text itself and it's estimating the time per slide, which I don't want it to do, but I had not disabled it prior to the lecture. OK, so that's I hope that answers it. Your question, Dr. Trixie. Yeah, so basically, Dr. Kenneth, it's uh, really trying to get as much help and be savvy with the kind of tools out there, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, if, Dr. If Kenneth, you are aware of the tool, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please proceed. Uh, sorry, you were saying if I'm aware of the uh, tool. If you're aware of the tools, it basically saves you a lot of time because I remember about 10, 15 years ago when we were lecturers, uh, most of the time was spent adjusting the PowerPoint slides. Now there's no need to do, do that anymore. Yeah. Please proceed. Yeah. Please proceed yeah, to I the have next. A, another question. I hope uh, I can take some a bit more of your time. You sure, mentioned sure. earlier yes. mentioned earlier about um, you know MOOC might be really um, helpful for UMS in a way that if we do specialty courses like Borneo uh, Indigenous Culture, which happens to be my specialty, so got me very excited. But yeah, uh, sure. I always wondered about delivering content of that nature uh, mm -hmm. when it involves social science concepts and humanities. I feel like to some extent, uh, even if we have a MOOC on it, I'm tempted to have something more personable or personalized like a master class. Do you, do you see that kind of arrangement happening? If, we, if let's say we do a MOOC and then it couples with a master class or how do you see it? 
Thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Trixie. Actually, that's the, what the question which I wanted to address, and I didn't cover it in the slides because of the time limitations. Okay, let's see how the masterclass evolved and how the MOOCs actually evolved. Earlier, the MOOCs, when they came out first about five years ago, they were basically a PowerPoint with somebody's face at the side in the corner, just as we do Google Meet. Okay, so later on, there was a demand for that. Later on, what happened is that the master class actually went one step forward. They went into professional photography. So they, when they do their photography, for example, they have cookery class. I attend one of their master classes on uh, cookery, on uh, gourmet cookery. It's about $60. So they do a very professional photography for that. The filming is very professional. They have everything professional. So they can package their product at a higher cost. Now, suppose you are doing a Borneo education, for example, a Borneo, which is a very good topic, which has international, uh, how do you say, significance. There'll be a lot of audience for that. It's better to revert to a MOOC and then transition to the master class. So the development of the content library is what is pertinent because they want, for example, if you are doing a, a, a local cooking, they will want to have proper videography of that cooking uh, part or the, the, for example, fabrics or the cultural practices of the language. You can basically, it's up to your imagination and your expertise. You can develop a master class on almost anything. OK, so I hope that answers your question. However, having said that, with regard to the master class, since it is a platform which is a, a, a commercialized platform, you may have to obtain permission from UMS to basically uh, develop content on a master class. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Trixie. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, Dr. Edmund, would you like to add on uh, to the MOOC affair? Yeah. I think Dr. Edmund can discuss the platform itself and the template. Dr. Edmund, are you around? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm around. Okay, good afternoon. Go. Currently in PEP, we are having... Can you put so your audio, uh, your mic nearer? Hello, can you hear my voice? Okay, okay. Was uh, good yeah, yeah. Good afternoon to all. So currently PEP, we, we already came out with the template that uh, to guide and to allow the lecturer and instructor to put in their contents one by one into the, into the table here. So from there, after that, you all submit your, later on, you all submit your template together with your content. In PEP, we will have the so-called the developer to, to help to edit, to do all those recording whatsoever later on in PEP. So from here, we will have a very proper and also high quality uh, work for to, to produce from the UMS later on. So this will be the, the, the one that we are going to do from the PEP side, okay? Thank you, uh, Edmund. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. So we, those who will be involved in MOOC will go batches by batches. So for the uh, first cohort, uh, it is open to those who have undergone and been certified uh, going through the webinar MOOC that was conducted by Commonwealth of Learning a few months ago. So uh, there were altogether over 200 uh, lecturers that registered, but eventually, again, as Dr. Kenner put it, you know, they are quite strict. So those who comply to certain uh, completion of assignment and up to a certain mark, then they were given a certificate. So all in, we have uh, 70 of our lecturers that were certified uh, to become so-called MOOC teachers. So this will be the first group. Uh, next week, they'll be receiving their letter and the template, okay? And it will be true to everybody else later on. So the template is one where they put in the content and uh, whatever uh, items there, then we will, out of the 70, we will select 30, okay? So, and out of the 30, it will be an appointment from the vice chancellor, okay, to be involved. And we will set very uh, stringent standard as well as short time duration. So only those who are committed, you know, uh, will be able to proceed and complete this MOOC development. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Kenneth and Dr. Edmund, anything else you want to say as a last word? Uh, yeah, Prof. Again, uh, thank you very much, Prof. And thank you very much to the participants for your time. You have, I have taken up your time, but I have shared it on YouTube in case you are interested. But what I would like to say in a nutshell is basically 
the MOC is a way forward to highlighting your expertise. That is what I want to highlight in the MOC. The purpose of the MOC is basically to bring out the best of you as a subject matter expert. Okay, thank you and stay safe. Yes, thank you. Edmund? Oh, okay, thank you very much everyone for attending this uh, webinar. So if you do have any questions uh, related to the MOOC or OER, please come forward to PEP. We are ready to help and to assist everyone. Thank you. Yes. And before uh, you leave this place, we will still keep this uh, chat open. Please, uh, can you please just uh, write in which particular kind of a topic that you think uh, we should organize? What is the need of actually our student, what is the actual need of our especially academic staff right now in this time of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic? So, Please uh, suggest whatever topic and we shall consider it together. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope that uh, it has been it has benefited every one of us. Okay, so terima kasih. Thank you so much for your time, your valuable time spent with us. Uh, please write to us, contact us in whatever matter related to TEL. Okay. Please uh, help to suggest some uh, topics before you go. <laughs> Thank you. We will leave it open for the next uh, 10 minutes, Nora. Yeah, we'll leave it open for Q&A. Yeah, here, if you need to ask, yeah. ask us any specific questions. Yeah, and also Q&A continue, yeah. But otherwise, uh, please suggest in the chat box. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Zoom. Thank you, Ponsami. Okay, prof. Yeah, and thank you, everybody. Hello, prof. Are yes. you listening? Yeah, we are here. Anything? Yeah. No. Why I can't post SMS messages? Oh, the, in the in the window, you cannot post. Yeah, you say that I am not permitted to post SMS. Okay, that's uh, actually everyone can post because you're in the UMS system. I can see you there. I can see you there. You just click on the conversation yeah. on the top, the conversation part. I, and you can. Yeah, I can see others also, you know, SMSing like the last message is from Dr. Juriz Ibrahim. Thank you, PEP. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. Yeah, but I, not like... see my skin is say that you are not permitted to post in general. Oh, maybe there are. Maybe there is some uh, because we have left it open. We have not changed any setting inside the system. We have not changed anything. It may be a unique setting in your computer. Maybe the antivirus. Generally, what will happen if you have a McAfee or other antiviruses, right? It blocks certain scripts in your computer. Is it from? Uh, is it coming out from your antivirus? The pop up. I think so because this is a tab, Samsung tab. Yeah, you are yeah, using maybe. your handphone, right, Doctor Tayek? Uh, no, tab. Tab, because because no, tab. I have I have been having the same problem. If I look through my mobile phone, I cannot post. The post is restricted. <laughs> so this hmm. is for me new experience. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, if you use the computer, you can post message. But if I use my iPhone, I cannot post anything. It mentioned here post restricted. So maybe Prof, maybe we can ask Rafik what in terms of mobile what is happening here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Generally the tab software is not adapted for the um, Windows platforms. If you're using a tab, it may not be adapted because the software is designed for mobile device, which is the handphone or the desktop or laptop. Yes. Okay. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Yes, it seems a problem, Prof Fong. Uh, I'm using my iPhone. This is uh, Mark's story here. Yes. And, uh, I have the same issue. It says post restricted. Uh, so it seems there's an issue with iPhone and using Microsoft Team. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah. I was trying from since it started with uh, our first mm. feature. Mm -hmm. OK, okay. Uh, Mark. I will refer this uh, immediately to our consultant, Mr. Rafik. Yes. Okay. Okay. We can still comment. To, we can still send messages to you, obviously, via the usual channels. 
Yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry. We can email you tell at UMS. Yeah. So we can still contact you with our ideas. So it's not nothing to worry about. Mark, could you uh, just have a snapshot of it and just uh, WhatsApp to me? Sure, I will do. can forward to him. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, today is the last day we have to, we can't, we can't go to the university anymore. We are working from home. Basically, uh, starting from today, huh? yeah, start from today or we have to get swab, but it's too painful to be swabbed. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a painful experience to get a swab. Is that, is that already in practice, Dr. Kenneth? Uh, based, on the based on the instructions from the federal, from the news. Okay, so that's basically a swab. The MKN has sent out in instructions for that. Sorry, Prof. Uh, Prof. Wong. Can you just put up your mobile number? I seem to have mislaid it in my contacts. I don't know why. Would you mind just putting your number on the on the chat in the chat box? Yes, I can see the chats, but I can't actually contribute. Thank you. Sorry for that. Can you see mine? Yes, thank you. Okay. I don't know why I don't have it. We've communicated before, so <laughs> maybe it was through the uh, the the uh, the tell uh, chat group. Okay. Okay. Probably. I think so. Prof. Wrong? Yes. And Dr. Kenneth, can I ask you something? Just to proceed. Just to proceed. Your formal presentation is already finished, am I right? Yep. Yes, 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 that's correct. You can okay. proceed to the. I have, I have just one course, and my section is over 300 students. So uh, the C student facing problem using Cisco event. Uh, say that again. Your students are facing problem with using Cisco Webex. Okay. What's the problem? Because they say they, that uh, they cannot log in and it takes too much data. I have a screenshot um, message from them. So luckily that that class I have a uh, seventy students. So that one uh, I'm going to continue with Google Meet. But okay. I have another section is above three hundred above three hundred and fifty above or 70. So that one I am already, because that one I am prepared to do Cisco WebEx, but as the students coming, uh, you know, remarks, comments on that, that they have, they are facing problem using that Cisco WebEx. So I am planning to using the other platform maybe. Yeah. Do you have mm -hmm. any suggestions? Does anyone uh, here have got a problem when using uh, Webex? Anyone who is still around here using a uh, Webex and you found that it is smooth running? It's, no, it's not actually smooth running. I also tried myself. Uh, so it's slow because of I have high number of students. I want to use this one. Correct. But now I'm afraid. Now I'm afraid that students is missing me. Okay. That 
uh, this creates yeah. problem for them. So that's why. Now, uh, uh, how many students, for example, will uh, make this complaint? That one is, uh, this one, uh, this group is 70 students, but I have another group is 370. Correct. This 70, yeah. out of the 70, uh, how many uh, could not log in and what was their, where are their location? Location is uh, inside Malaysia, but I think uh, Kampung areas or something. I okay. have a SMS. I, I will, so, I will observe that one. Yeah, yeah, it's good to actually use use a Google form to do a survey to exactly identify where is the location. It might be the connectivity problem within the locality. It might be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, because our WebEx is supposed to be able to accommodate so, so many. No problem. But I have found one thing. I have, uh, we have seen our one colleague, he used Facebook Live. Yes. You know, it was uh, like uh, fantastic, I saw. And uh, because it was Facebook Live, uh, he was the coordinator. So I also checked that how is going on. Then it was fantastic. I saw and many students. So there was no problem. And he just delivered his speech smoothly. At that time, I saw. So I think, what do you think about Facebook Live? Does it connect? You like to respond to that? Sorry, Prof. Yeah, yes, Prof. Regarding the Facebook Live, right? It's uh, it's a good platform, but again, there may be no connectivity in certain areas where you have a low bandwidth. And then the Kampung, I think it's not possible to access Facebook Live. The same issue. It's it's not the platform in itself. It is the connectivity which is the concern. So mm. I think this one we have to discuss with the JTMK because you, you, you see it comes down to the number of servers which are actually using that, mirroring that. So for example, in the case of Microsoft Teams, there are fewer mirrors. Mirrors meaning the number of servers which replicate. Google has many servers. That's why Google is very smooth. And the Microsoft team, you may have certain glitches inside because it's very complex platform. The same may be the case with Zoom and WebEx. It may be not having too many mirrors and that may be the issue because of that problem. Prof. So I think this is a technical thing. It's not related to the platform itself. Yeah, Dr. Kenneth, I think because below 100 students, we don't have any problem. I think we can easily use Google Meet at least, but yes. the high volume of the student number, that one is maybe concern. Yeah. Yes, it's a cause of concern. Yes. Concern. Yes. So that's one of how we to deal this one. This is the problem. But yeah, that one I saw my colleague, he used that one section Facebook to, it was okay. Because uh, it was okay, I saw quite okay. Mm -hmm. But Facebook, Facebook Live, I think you cannot share uh, PowerPoint slides. Am I right? You cannot share, but you, you will have to use what is known as, there are ways to share it, but it's difficult. There are most of the Facebook, if you're uh, doing Facebook Live or Google Live, we use OBS Studio. You have to download something known as OBS Studio. OK, I can share the link with you and you have to download it and then you can do a Facebook stream using that uh, slides. OK. Thank you. Sorry, keeping you here. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. No problem. Rob? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Syed. I, I will actually SMS you the screenshot because actually student facing, I think, down uh, even uh, problem in Cisco OBEX, I think. It's okay. I think we can resolve it with JTMK. We asked them the uh, basically the capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Yeah. You too. Stay yeah. safe. You stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay, I think there is uh, no more information coming in. So we basically close the session. Okay. Prof. We shall okay. close the session now. Thank okay. you thank very everybody. Much. Thank you for your time and hope everyone will enjoy and benefited from this session. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you Dr. Kenneth. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Thank you, Monsami. Okay. Nora, Zhu, terima kasih banyak -banyak. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.